capitalism like light, like air, can really show up like an uninvited guest in rooms of the house where it wasn't supposed to have shown up. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. So I was asked to have a debate with a young author called uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, and I was quite pleasantly surprised by the originality of many ideas. And so because they touch very strongly on issues of ESG and corporate purpose we discuss in many of our podcasts, I thought that was an interesting uh, idea to bring him on the podcast and look at it a little bit more deeply. So the title of Vivek's book is Woke Inc. Inside Corporate America's Social Justice Scam. Even if you are opposed to the concept of his book, there are some really, really interesting ideas in here, like our granting of limited liability to corporations and what that means they owe or don't owe in in exchange. But The overriding thought behind his book is that wokeism has become a way for for corporations to wrap themselves in a mantle that then furthers the idea of crony capitalism. Corporate America is expanding his power into all sorts of places it was never meant to be by wrapping itself in the mantle of wokeism and sometimes doing doing the opposite, but that this this has the dangerous um, effect of expanding the corporation into spheres in which it was not supposed to be. I have to say that I was pleasantly surprised reading the book because it's actually much deeper than the typical book you see on this topic. And there are some uh, clever legal ideas and different viewpoints. Tell us a little bit about your background and your founding of Roy Vant and what brought you to your current views of the world. The title of your book has quite a provocative title, Woke Inc. Inside Corporate America's Social Justice Scam. Not, uh, um, not the point of view you come across from a, from a young entrepreneur uh, every day. I'll give you the short version of my background. So I was a scientist by background, studied molecular biology in undergrad, thought I was going to be a scientist, ended up joining the world of hedge fund investing in biotech. Uh, three years in, I told my bosses I was going to leave. I wanted to go to law school at Yale and scratch an itch in law that I'd never really scratched. So I did that for three years. Came back to New York City. And when I came full time to my job as an investor without law school, I had a lot of time on my hands. And so I did a six month stint in stand up comedy on the side where I got the best piece of advice I've gotten professionally, which was to carry around a notebook wherever you go and write something down when it really annoys the hell out of you. Didn't work for me too well in stand up comedy, but I did that in my day job as a biotech investor and ended up writing down all the things that annoyed me about the farm industry and decided that was my business plan for starting Royvan. Thankfully, been a multi-billion dollar success today that's gotten multiple drugs developed, several of which are FDA approved products for patients today. So, uh, but earlier this year, I did step down ahead of the publication of a book that as you noted, was sufficiently controversial that actually it was going to probably have an adverse impact on my company if I didn't separate my voice as a CEO from my voice as a citizen. And so that's what I decided to do in some ways practicing what I preached by separating business from from politics. Can you describe a bit what is the argument and what is your potential solution? Yes, sure, sure. So the argument is really simple. If the government can't do something under the constitution, then the government cannot deputize a private company to go do that same thing instead. There's a case called Brentwood, which lays out the standards for finding state action in the guise of a private enterprise. And what Brentwood says is that if a private company is responsive to the threat of a government official, if a private company is responding to the inducement of the government, or if a private company is coordinating with the government, willful participation in a joint activity, any of those three conditions could be the basis for finding state action in the guise of a private company. And the funny thing about what we see with modern big tech censorship today is we see not one of those conditions met, not two of those conditions, but all three of those conditions. You know, the White House boasting every day, every week nowadays about working with social media companies to remove misinformation or hate speech as defined by the White House. You have congressmen that issue threats that big tech then responds to. And there's a statute called Section 230, which is to immunize those companies to take down content that the government could not take down directly. So that's the case I made both in that op-ed and in more detail in my book. Couldn't you argue that that same legal argument could apply to the existence of the big banks in the sense that the big banks exist with the support of the Federal Reserve, which in many ways is the support of the government? So couldn't you, in this age of crony capitalism, couldn't you extend that argument to industries beyond Silicon Valley? 
Yeah, I think some of those same principles could absolutely apply. I, I think the key point, though, is is the government using that private party to do something that the government could not legally do on its own anyway. And, and Bethany, I think the answer is actually you could bring that argument to bear in a lot of cases. For example, what you saw in the settlements after the 2008 financial crisis, there were multi-million dollar settlements, multi-billion dollar settlements, I should say, between big banks and the Obama DOJ. Now, the Obama administration at the same time wanted to pass a budget that included a lot of dollars that it threw to certain left-leaning nonprofits. But the past the 2010 election, when the Tea Party took over Congress, the Tea Party-led Republicans took over Congress, Congress said, no, we're not going to spend that money. You know, like it or not, you could debate whether that was a good policy or bad policy. That's life in a two-party system. Well, what the Obama DOJ then did was to say that actually, hey, big banks, we had a deal for you. For every dollar that you give to this nonprofit that Congress refused to fund, we're going to give you three dollars off the amount that you owe to the public fisc. Oh, and by the way, your press release is going to look a heck of a lot better if you say that you didn't pay a DOJ fine, but you gave it to a 501c3. Oh, and by the way, if you give it to a 501c3, that's also tax deductible. So banks being fond of money, we're happy to keep more money. But I think the Obama DOJ was able to, and the Obama administration was able to do indirectly through the back door, funding nonprofits they wanted to fund using federal dollars to do it, what they could not do through the front door, the constitutionally ordained process for budgeting. So, so in a certain sense, you're absolutely right that it could, could apply to banks. Um, but I think it could really apply to any industry. And I think it's the defining uh, tenet of crony capitalism in the modern moment is not just private companies using government to gain competitive advantages over one another, but rather government using private companies in return to do what government itself couldn't do under a constitutionally ordained democracy. So yes, is the answer to that question. But you have a very interesting twist on the purpose of cooperation, uh, a revisitation on Friedman uh, piece that we discuss many times on our podcast. You are saying that actually Friedman missed the political dimension of the cooperation, but then you use this in an intriguing way. Can you explain our listeners what, what, what you're doing in your, in your book? Milton Friedman basically never responded to, I think, the best argument for stakeholder capitalism. I think it goes something like this. It's that the state allows the corporation to exist. Society gives corporate shareholders this legally invented privilege called limited liability to say that the shareholders and owners of a corporation do not bear the debts or liabilities of that corporation, even as they benefit from its profits. That's a creation of law. And society would have never conferred that benefit on corporate shareholders without some quo in return for that quid. And that quo for the quid, they argued, was the implicit understanding that those corporations existing as a separate entity with separate legal privileges were supposed to also implicitly advance the interests and take into account the interests of society at large, take into account their own negative externalities and the rest of society at large when making their decisions, or else society would have never agreed to that trade. My central point in the book that I wrote, Woke Inc., is that actually they have a point. There was a quid pro quo at the inception of the corporation in return for this grand bargain of limited liability, but it was not an implicit grand bargain as the stakeholder capitalists presuppose. It was an explicit grand bargain that said that in return for this great gift of limited liability, corporate America and shareholders, we're going to make a demand of you. And the demand is that your directors and officers only concern themselves with what allows you as a corporation to make the most profit and nothing else. And Milton Friedman just said, oh, well, limited liability was for the benefit of corporate shareholders to incentivize capital formation. And by the way, so too was the demand to protect shareholders through the fiduciary duty of corporate directors, that both of those are just gifts to shareholders to subsidize the size of a greater economic pie. I say no. Those are actually running in opposite directions. One was a gift. The other was a demand. The demand was to say they're going to create corporations so powerful that they were going to ultimately be insulated from liability. Their owners were going to be insulated from liability. That if we're going to create Frankenstein's monster, we want to keep Frankenstein's monster in the cage, in the cage of the market, in the cage of capitalism itself, to make sure that that monster doesn't roam free over other terrains of our life, be it family life or religious life or certainly civic or democratic life. While we're on the subject of Friedman, early on in the book, you talk about negative externalities that would might lead you to conclude that a company should exercise some restraint in maximizing its profits. And you say this issue rarely arises in the real world because most corporate actions you write that are known to harm people are either illegal, Ill illegal or likely to hurt the company's reputation. But that seems to me that it doesn't, that that's not right. Think about social media, for example, where their profit maximization is arguably in all of our worst interests. Or think about a company like Coca-Cola or Pepsi, which sells products that are arguably not good for our health. And so what restraint do you think should exist on a company's behavior if it isn't a, notion, a broader notion of responsibility to the public? Yeah, well, I think in each of those cases, though I happen to share your opinions 
on the net in the net effects of, of social media or soft drinks on what's net good. I, I think that we, neither you nor I, though we happen to agree with each other, can exercise the hubris of presuming that our answer is the correct one as to whether or not the externalities on balance were negative or whether the, the net effects inclusive of those externalities were on balance negative or positive relative to the utility that the individual users of that platform gained from being able to communicate with their cousins on the other side of the world via WhatsApp or the, the satisfaction they get when they drink a cup of Coke at night. I, I mean, I think that those are questions that it would be a, a you know, what Hayek would have called a fatalistic hubris for us to think that we could know here what was the net effect of what was positive or negative with the vantage point of one. Now, I personally think that if we think that those things are problematic, we should have the political courage to be able to debate those in the open, in the sphere of public debate, through free speech and open debate and democracy, to say that, to me, it's a betrayal of that system to ultimately relegate to Facebook that responsibility. And ironically, if we think the problem of our day is that Facebook and Twitter have become the churches of, of modernity, we make that problem worse by making those churches exercise the discretion over what makes their users more or less angry, what does or doesn't prey on the psychic insecurities of the teen girls who have body image issues because they use it. We should actually solve that problem, in my opinion, and I kind of am conservative about these things, about reviving the actual churches in the offline world or the actual institution of the family in the offline world or our schools that create a culture of adults through education that don't suffer from those same psychic insecurities that social media companies can prey upon. That's how we ought to be fixing these issues, not deciding to ask Mark Zuckerberg or, or Jack Dorsey on a given day to internalize their presumption of what was and wasn't a negative externality, when in fact, what it was or isn't a negative externality is part of the question that's on the table. Whether something's a negative externality or not, we talk about this as though that's a facile and obvious answer. The question of whether that externality exists, let alone of whether it's positive or negative, is a normative question, not a descriptive one. And normative questions ought to be sorted through mechanisms like the one that we're having here on a civic scale writ large through a democratic process that we call a, our constitutional system of governance. Let me make a, a less sexy example, literally, about pollution. And since you are from Ohio, let's talk about DuPont. As you know, DuPont dump in the Ohio River with a substance called PFOA, known to be toxic, creating a, nu a number of cancer and so on and so forth, okay? Thanks to a Documents Emerger trial, I was able to write a paper at the cost-benefit analysis that DuPont did in 1984. They had pretty clear that there were some cost of incinerating this uh, PFOA, and they were pretty clear that it was a toxic substance that would have created a number of, of death. They knew perfectly well. Now, not only they did something that cost hundreds of lives and was devastating, they got away with that for years and years. In fact, I spent time looking at, speaking of reputation, the reputation of the directors of uh, DuPont at the time. They all died or retire, completely unaffected by reputation. In fact, some of them in their obituary even added to an environmental uh, steward and pioneer. OK, so they got away literally with murder in a way that imposed enormous externality and no cost. And this is no doubt that is a negative externality. Having a testicular cancer or kidney cancer is not something that can be considered an enjoyment. So in this particular case, we could not even have a debate because at the time, nobody knew how dangerous the substance was, except a few scientists in DuPont and in 3M. So I acknowledge, so, so I want to say something at the outset, and, and, I, and I, I, you know, call out Milton Friedman for sort of dancing around his limited liability issue. If someone's going to call out for me in the book, this is the issue that I kind of dance around a little bit and didn't, didn't really address head on. That could you come up with a, and you're getting pretty darn close there, uh, Luigi, to, to, to an example that it isn't even a straw man. I mean, it's a real world example that puts pressure on my argument that ultimately has to recognize the fact that the position I'm committed to in the heart of the argument that I'm making is one that says that even for an infinitesimally small negative externality, that is a known negative externality, not social media effects on teen body girl images, but like cancer. And to know that you know you're doing something wrong, but to also recognize that it's illegal and be committed to say that it's not gonna have enough of a reputational impact in the long run that's gonna cause me to make a different decision, but I'm still gonna make the profit maximizing decision instead because I have an obligation to. I think it's possible to force someone into that box. I think the, and, 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 I, and I'm, I'm uh, the first person to admit, that I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that, with that conclusion, putting myself in the shoes of such executive. I think that the, the number of gymnastics you need to go through to get there is sufficiently, to put it kindly, I think, I think academically abstruse 
so as to almost never be relevant to inform the ways in which we may want to make decisions in the ordinary. And I think that the fact that that's such a hard d distinction to make or a hard decision to make is part of what defines the, the otherwise normal cases that I'm discussing that don't put quite the level of pressure on those boundary conditions as your example did. I guess the thing I would say in response is, let's just take uh, Volkswagen, which was the ESG company of the year, several years in a row, as it was actually perpetrating the scandal of actually fixing, that is sort of cheating on the, the measurement of its own emissions tests in its own cars. If the question is, does my sort of worldview on this question, even under boundary conditions, hold water to be a structurally, a structurally intact standalone argument in its own right as a perfect system? It probably doesn't, uh, under at least those boundary conditions that you sort of put pressure on. But neither does stakeholder capitalism, which actually created the very conditions that deterred the kind of regulatory scrutiny. So if your point is that laws and regulations would be insufficient as a mechanism for cur curtailing negative externalities because they could never know what the next negative externality was going to be. OK, that's an imperfect system. I acknowledge it's an imperfect system. I guess the, 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 the best response I'd have to offer is it is a less imperfect system than one in which we actually delegate that authority voluntarily to actors to assume upon themselves because it actually creates the conditions for deterring the kind of scrutiny that would have better policed against the very negative externality we cared about. And I think the fact that Volkswagen was the ESG company of the year probably had something to do with the fact that it took longer to detect the fact that they were cheating on their own emissions test. So that's that's what I would say is, if it's a choice between less imperfect options, that's an argument that I'm much more comfortable uh, defending than one that puts me in the position to have to say that it would necessarily prevent uh, extra, all negative externalities in the optimal way to simply think that they should be identified by regulation in advance, which is not a position I'm prepared to espouse. So it seems to me that perhaps the lines between the behavior that you think a corporation should engage in and what it shouldn't might be a little slippery than you than you think. And one part of this question is that brands have been tangled up with politics for decades. Pepsi and General Motors were among the companies to stop doing business in apartheid era South Africa. Was that okay? Was was that not okay? You write in the book that Roy Vont chose a, um, a policy of, of wanting to hire a certain number of employees whose families were at, were at the 25th percentile of income or below because you thought that was good for the company. But what's then different between a company then embracing wokeism as its mantra because they believe that creates a better world and will help them make more profits as time goes on? So how do you draw a line between the kind of behavior that, that is acceptable for a company to engage in because that company believes it's going to benefit its bottom line? And over the long term and that which isn't? That's a good question. So, so, so I think that a company should ultimately make the determination of what's going to benefit its own bottom line and make those decisions accordingly. And if it's bending the knees, to, if, it, if that includes publicly bending the knee to some sort of neo-progressive orthodoxy that consumers demand that the company bend its knee to as a condition for buying from the company, and that's what allows the company to make the most profit, then I don't fault that corporate leader for making the decision that they do. Side note, I, I do then go into separate category of faults, which is where those companies don't actually do the same thing in places like China today, but do so here as a form of hypocrisy that I think at least deserves to be called out. Calling it out there is half the solution because consumers are then less likely to say that they want to buy products from companies that match their values when they realize that matching their values is geographically contingent. But put that small caveat to one side, I basically don't fault companies for doing what allows them to sell the most products legally. However, I think that the impulse that creates the conditions for that to be the profitable thing for the company to do reveals a separate cultural cancer in our society that goes beyond the scope of what law ought to concern itself with, but that, ought, but that we ought to concern ourselves with as thinking citizens who care about the future of a republic and the future of a generation that fails to derive meaning from the kinds of things that used to fill our hunger for meaning. We have a generation of Americans who are hungry for purpose and meaning and identity and hungry for a cause who have resorted to thin acts of mixing morality with commercialism as a way of filling a moral hunger that demands more substantial fare. And I think that sometimes a shirt is just a shirt at the end of the day and a sandwich is just a sandwich. And by ultimately tricking a generation into thinking that they're discharging a moral obligation by buying a shirt or buying a sandwich, when in fact, they ultimately grew up in under conditions that ultimately never allowed them to have the experience of either doing pure service in their own right. You do it because you want to get into college. When you ultimately are, it comes to be your turn to pursue self-interest in your own right, you never built the muscle memory of doing either one alone and were left with the bastardized version of both commingled. So I'm not saying that there's a legal solution to that problem. I don't think that's the fault of any CEO or an investor in that case, meeting the demands of that generation. But I do think it is an occasion for us to reflect as a people on who we are and who we want to be and whether or not we want to live in a society whose 
citizenry grows up to be the adult generation of who's raising kids to think that the right way to ultimately exhibit virtue is to signal your virtue as a substitute for being virtuous itself. And, and I think that's a discussion that goes beyond the scope of, of capitalism or economics. But, but Bethany, I think one of the things that I do often say, and this relates to our exchange earlier about the social media companies, is that virtue, in my opinion, is a precondition for capitalism. It's not a product of capitalism. And I think that you know, I, I sometimes joke that capitalism would be the perfect system for er organizing uh, a society's affairs if that society were virtuous, where virtue is defined as people who want what they ultimately need. If our wants perfectly matched our needs, then capitalism would be, would be the holiest system we could find to organize that society's affairs. But to the extent that I find faults with capitalism on its own terms, it's to the extent that our, that our wants diverge from our needs. And I think that virtue is the delta between the two that we need to fill. And doing it through the pursuit of commercialism is, is an optical illusion that creates the phenomenological experience of having discharged the obligations of virtue without having actually engaged with the tougher stuff underlying those moral questions. And, and that goes you know, probably beyond the scope of our conversation about what capital is and capital isn't. What do you raise, I think, is incredibly important. And, and the issue between virtue and capital is to what extent uh, capitalists need some virtue to prosper, but also to what extent capitalism undermines the very virtues that needs to survive. And I fear that many modern corporations induce amorality by what a, a writer of the uh, Financial Times described, a combination of the Nixon and the Eichmann defense. There is the CEO that uses the Nixon defense and say, I did not do anything. My underling did it and I wasn't aware. And the underling used the Eichmann defense. I was order. I didn't have any choice. And in between these two, anything goes. And we've seen with the financial crisis, we've seen uh, with the opioids, we've seen over and over and over again. And it seems that, uh, yes, there was a lot of amorality also in the past. But I think that uh, uh, large corporations with this mentality seems to be pushing even more in that direction. Yeah, I, I think... Um I, I don't disagree with you there. I think my worldview is a, a little bit different than what you outlined at the outset, Luigi. It's not that virtue is a precondition for capitalism to work. Virtue is a precondition for society to work. And capitalism is just one of those spheres of our lives that governs the commercial side of our affairs. And you know, if that's the impulse that determines who I vote for in my annual election to the board of, direction of, board of directors of Apple, that's great. It's not a one person, it's not a one person, one vote system. It's a one share one vote system. And that's fine in the rules of capitalism. Deciding whether this phone rises to the top or a different phone model rises to the top, I'm fine with that. But there are other spheres and spaces in our lives too. There's the civic sphere of our lives where actually it doesn't matter how many shares of Apple you own. Your opinion on whether or not the you know battle for climate change ought to be won in one way or another or not at all, ought to be one where everyone's voice and vote is actually counted equally irrespective of the number of shares of Apple or Google that you own. And by the way, that's just the civic sphere of, of our lives, which is totally different than the, than the religious sphere of our lives, where we may exercise pursuits of truth and accessing higher truth that go beyond reason or go beyond self-interest. And we, in that sphere of our lives, access truth in a different way, which is different than our family, which is one where we don't exercise our impulses of self-interest within the unit of a family as we do in the same way as an individual agent in an economy. And so that's sort of, that's sort of my broader worldview is we have Part of American pluralism is the plurality of these institutions that underlie our culture. And part of the preserving that pluralism means keeping those institutions apart from one another. Church from state, but also capitalism from democracy. Virtue is a precondition for capitalism, not for capitalism to work in its own right, which is what your point was about, is whether capitalism can undermine its own goals that way. That's less what I'm concerned with as the ways in which capitalism, like light, like air, can really show up like an uninvited guest in parts, in rooms of the house where it wasn't supposed to have shown up. And for the house to ultimately stand on its own two feet. It's not just the way the, cap the room assigned to capitalism ultimately operates that matters. That's the sphere of the market. But the ways in which the, the air in one room accidentally pollutes or invades that of another room, and that's when we lose the structural integrity of the house itself. And I want to say I've never gotten this far uh, in a podcast, certainly not this one that's this short. So, uh, so this was, this was uh, quite fun to, get, uh, to go that deep in, in, uh, in a half hour. Likewise, likewise. Thanks for the... Uh, availability also short term. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Yeah, yeah, really thank you for your time. Probably the most interesting idea in his book is this notion of limited liability that we granted this 
we granted this to corporations as part of our system so that corporations can do things people can't and have their owners, their shareholders be insulated from the consequences of their actions in, in effect. And it's one of those things that is so foundational to capitalism that we, we take it for granted without, without thinking about it, that in fact, that is a gift to corporations. And so that is actually the strongest defense for stakeholder capitalism, because in exchange for being given this, a corporation actually owes quite, quite a bit. And his argument instead is that because he perceives that as being so dangerous and expanding corporate power that he thinks what a corporation owes instead is to stay in its lane and be forced to stay in its lane by, by, by just making profits. And that really forced me to reevaluate the whole friedman ask idea that just to focus on the bottom line is, 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 is bad and dangerous somehow. We want companies to care about more than that. I'm still mulling it over because, because I, think, I think he has a point. He definitely has a point. And the debate on the purpose of corporation has been around for at least 50 years, actually much more, but at least 50 years since the piece by Milton Friedman. So it's not easy to have an original point on this front. And he definitely has an original point. Now, I'm not 100% convinced that his historical narration of the story is correct, in particular because we grant limited liability to no, non-profit institutions. And so the fact that you have to have a profit motive in order to not be dangerous, I think is a bit far-fetched. And, and especially today, there is such a thing as the benefit corporation where you can look at all the stakeholders and you still have limited liability. So, but one of the reasons against uh, the freedom of corporation in Europe was the fact that corporation could basically create political opposition. So the fear that granting limited liability to some organization might make this organization powerful and be powerful opponent to a regime is something that has definitely been around. And I think he's building on this idea in a very interesting twist. I've been obsessed for a long time, as you know, with the idea that corporations occupy a shadow justice system, and they certainly have since the global financial crisis with settlements where nobody is held responsible. And when you read the settlements, you can't tell who, who did what. There are, no, there are no people named. There are no humans. It's just a corporation pleading guilty to something that by reading the settlements, you would think that nobody did. And so when, when, when I combine that with his thought about limited liability, I think we really have created this whole parallel system for corporations where the people now often have, and I know there's movements afoot at the Justice Department to try to make people be accountable for the actions of the corporation, but we have created this whole system where the corporation isn't prosecuted criminally because that would destroy the corporation, and the people aren't prosecuted criminally because they're just the people and the company is its own entity. And it just, it just is a very, we've allowed this monster to really grow out of control. Oh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I did not know, and I'm, I have to say I'm appalled, of how the proceeds of the fines are allocated. It seems like uh, one of the most corrupt systems on the face of earth. And it's just, if something like that had happened in Italy, I would say, oh, the typical uh, Italian corruption. But in fact, this is at the core, not only of the United States, but of the Obama administration that was considered actually a clean administration by, by many standards. So I think that, that that's a very interesting uh, uh, twist. Yeah, and we should lay that out. So what he says in the book is that all the billions of dollars in fines that the big banks paid in the wake of the financial crisis, it's actually unclear where they went. They didn't necessarily go to homeowners. Instead, the big banks were given credit and allowed to reduce the amount of money that they paid as long as they sent them to various generally left-wing um, organizations that work on issues like social justice and homeownership. And that is really, I, 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 that is a form of extortion that, that I find extremely, extremely worrying. Because to, to, to his point, then you do have an incentive for big banks or powerful firms to wrap themselves in certain um, in certain policies that appear to be in favor by the government in order to insulate themselves from the effects of their actions elsewhere. And it's not even the people who are harmed who end up getting getting the benefits necessarily. And there's something quite quite ugly about that. I also thought it was really interesting, his point about corporations often draping themselves in this mantle of wokeness and then doing something completely different um, in the places where they think no one is looking. And his, his point about Airbnb and its, its affiliation with the Chinese Communist Party and all the companies who talk about how much they care about social justice and then are manufacturing in essentially slave labor camps in China. I mean, there's... <laughs> It's quite a triumph of narrative over reality. No, that's true. But I have to say, 
the fact that many corporations are hypocrites, I don't think is that new. I think he's, he writes it very well and very effectively and with a lot of facts. So uh, kudos to him. But I don't think that that's particularly new. What I find particularly intriguing because it's uh, very aggressive, but I think it's definitely an, an element of truth, is this idea that uh, rise of wokeism was really a response to, to, to the revolt that was developing after the financial crisis, including uh, Occupy Wall Street. So he basically said that one of the reasons is uh, uh, in, faced with this challenge to their authority by a movement like Occupy Wall Street, the banks and in general the large corporations embrace one part of the revolt, the part that was very cheap for them to embrace, uh, be politically correct and emphasize the diversity element, and hide under the, the carpet the aspects they, they don't like, which is maybe a redistribution of wealth or of uh, political power. He, he calls it a marriage made in hell. You put together uh, lefty uh, radicals who need money and some large corporation who need moral authority. As a result, you get this uh, war corporation that have both money and legal authority being at the center of the universe. I think he's right about that because <laughs> you don't see many CEOs of large corporations saying, I'm going to cut my salary in half in order to make the world a more equitable place. I'm going to take my own personal wealth, my own my, my options in this company, and instead I'm going to give them to, to charity X of my choosing in order to make the world a better place, or I'm going to donate them across my company to the lowest paid workers in my company to make sure that my company company is a more equitable place. No, they spend shareholders' money and they spend the corporation's money, but you haven't seen corporate, you haven't seen CEO salaries go down. And to me, that feels like the ultimate proof that what he's saying has, has some validity to it because nobody's embracing a policy that actually hurts the people who have the most power and are the most, and, and could, could give something up. They're not giving anything up. You know, Bethany, I'm doing a research uh, over a long period of time. This one is actually from 1955 to today about the letters that CEOs write to their shareholders at the beginning of the annual report. Of course, it's uh, pretty tedious in many dimensions, but one of the interesting aspects is uh, you see these gems. And one of the gems is uh, a letter that is written, um, I think, in the late 50s by the CEO of, uh, then CEO of IBM in which she says that he's giving up his stock options to the employees. Really? So, yes. So, you know, I'm not saying that this is a rule, but it's, it's interesting that you do find early on some CEOs that uh, do exactly what you say they will never do. I think it would be un unthinkable today, but that's kind of the level of stakeholderism that uh, I really appreciate because uh, you put your money where your mouth is. Well, it is, you know, what would be an interesting comparison is that back in the day of stakeholder capitalism, before the Raiders came along in the 1980s and said, we want, and before Friedman's ideas really began to be the mantra in, in corporate America, it would be interesting to see the extent to which stakeholder capitalism was practiced. And one measure of that was just the discrepancy between the highest paid worker, the highest paid employee at the company and the lowest paid one. I don't have the numbers at the tip, tip of my finger. We can find them, but they, it's so much more dramatic today. It's even through all the talk about a return to stakeholder capitalism, that that gap has only gotten has only gotten bigger. Whereas back in the day, companies actually, maybe because they were forced to by the strength of unions, I don't necessarily think people were better people um, back, 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 back in those days, but <laughs> maybe they were, I don't know. But, um, but, but back in the day, they certainly walked the walk more than they do today. There was more of a sense of we're all in this together. And now it's words that we're all in this together and we care about justice and equality, but it's not the actions. But to be fair, at a time where the marginal tax rate was close to 90%, the CEO had very little incentives to pay himself more and they were paying them in kind. So in stuff that is not easily measured, but if you have uh, access to a very sophisticated club and uh, the company pays those memberships and uh, all the stuff doesn't didn't used to enter at least in the compensation was a way in which uh, they were compensated but uh, it was uh, very tax efficient and less visible so over the years part of that I'm not saying that it's the only thing going on but part of that is that there was a greater transparency in the amount uh, they were paid because it was all in cash in cash or stocks but very measurable 
That's that's actually really interesting that it was easier to measure it than than it perhaps is today, despite all the SEC's moves to try to make um, executive pay more transparent. Uh, I thought he he gave a really good answer to one of the questions I asked him in a way that is actually more nuanced than it is in the book, because the the part of the book, it's right at the beginning that made me really say, no, 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 was when he basically says there's no such thing as bad profits, that a corporation is never incentivized. It's it's a very Alan Greenspan-esque thing to say, that a corporation is never incentivized to do the, the wrong thing and make profits in a bad way because it wouldn't last and it would destroy their reputation and that would probably be illegal and that he and his time as the CEO of Roy Vaughn never failed. That um, never faced that that particular issue, and I thought, oh come on! As I asked him, you know, everything from social media to Coca Cola, the list of companies making profits in ways that are not good for the health of the population is 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 long. But he's right that there's a personal viewpoint at, at work in that. And I actually thought he was right that this is then the job of a government to put guardrails on capitalism. It's not the job of the company to say, I won't make profits in this particular way. It actually is the job of the government to say, we won't allow you to make profits in this way. And that that's a place possibly where our government is failing on multiple levels today, whether it's allowing companies to do whatever they will in China or or whether it's our failure to impose any kind of limits on social media, or whether it's the crisis of obesity in this country, which has made COVID a thousand times worse than it would otherwise have been, and which has been enabled by untrammeled marketing from from companies that sell food that makes you fat. But actually, let me push back a little bit on this, because if it comes to climate change, I think we probably agree that a carbon tax imposed by the government would be the most efficient thing rather than trying to have the self-limitations that don't work very well. But especially if you are a conservative like he is and is not afraid to say, uh, you don't want a government to intervene in so many other things. So saying that, uh, oh, you shouldn't do anything because the government should take care of that. And then when uh, it turns to the moment in which the government should intervene, you said, oh, we don't want too much regulation, want too much intervention. You can have it, have it both ways. So that, that's number one. And number two, which is related, is there are certain areas where it's very, very hard for the government to intervene. Partly because it's uh, uh, poorly informed, arrived late, and uh, government rules should be homogeneous. So if you have one rule that fits everybody, it's very hard to have an efficient rule. Uh, you would like to leave more flexibility, but I think that having some human decency, I think is, is probably something we would like to believe that individuals have, and the question is, do corporations have? Well, I think that has changed over time, and I'll relay an anecdote to back that up. I, I actually agree with that, and it would be really interesting to see if he is a hypocrite when, 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 if, if that actually happened in the real world. Because on that note, he actually agrees with Tariq Fancy, who probably couldn't be more opposite than him in political ideology. At least that's just my guess from our conversation with Tariq. But they both agree that it's the job of the government to intervene in matters like climate change and lay down the rules and not the job of corporations. Tariq, because he thinks corporations are just pretending. Vivek, because he thinks it expands the cor- expands the power of corporations too much. But it's an interesting place in which two people from very different ideologies sort of sort of sort of meet in the middle. Back to your point, I, I do think that has changed, and your that gets to the last comments he made at the end about a fundamental sense of virtue in a society. And I I do worry that we've we've lost some of that. I remember talking to someone for um, a book, the last book, big book I wrote on the financial crisis. Um, And this guy was an old school Republican operative. And he said, basically, they're just things we wouldn't do. You knew that if you went into the guardrails and off the lanes that we would kill you. And it just wasn't allowed. They're just things people just, it wasn't decent. It wasn't, it wasn't the way business should be done. We didn't need a government to tell us that not to do that. We just, we just didn't. And I think a concrete example of what people just didn't do, we saw in the Valiant scandal. Um, And oddly enough, Martin Shkreli is in, (laughs) is in Vivek's book. But Valiant made its profit simply by taking taking existing drugs and raising the price on them to whatever the market would bear. That was always a strategy that was legal. That was always a strategy. Companies could have done that 30 years ago, 20 years ago. They just didn't because that just wasn't an okay way to make money and nobody would have done that. And yet in, in, in our time, we had not only Valiant do precisely that, but then private equity guys seeded a bunch of companies to copy Valiant's strategy because it was such an easy way to make money. So there wasn't a sense of this is morally reprehensible and we don't, we don't do this. And so there do seem to be some ways in which the guardrails of decency have 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 fallen apart. And I say that with some degree of wariness because I don't love the sort of nostalgia of back in the old days. But but I think there might be some truth to it. 
Vivek has a great line in his book about uh, the fact uh, that Shrelly, the famous or infamous uh, hedge fund manager who increased the price of a drug by, what, 300% or 1,000%, uh, or I don't remember, like an outrageous amount, and then ended up in jail for a completely different reason, but ended up in jail, has done with gusto what every drug executive does a little bit with less uh, flair, which is to keep increasing the price of drugs. The reason why everybody sh shows so much uh, moral outrage vis-a-vis Shrelly, it was not because uh, of what he did, but it's because it was ruining the game for everybody else. There's a slightly different reason. It's not just because it was ruining the game for everybody else. It's because his company wasn't public at the time and he wasn't sharing with everybody else. So I remember asking a guy who was an investor in Valiant who was expressing outrage about what Chakrelli had done. And he, he said, you know, just the worst thing ever. And I said, well, why is what Valiant's doing any different? And he looked at me and said, that's a really good question. And so the difference was, is that people in power could invest in Valiant and make share in the profits. And with Martin Shakrelli, they, they, they couldn't. And now is the moment of our capital is, capital isn't question, where we pick a current news and we decide whether it fits with a model of uh, working capitalism or it is uh, isn't because uh, really isn't working. So there have been a couple of stories in the last few days about a topic that's been ongoing, which is cor the pressure corporations are putting pe on people to go back to the office. As more Americans get vaccinated, workers and companies are figuring out what post-pandemic work life will look like and how it may change permanently. Facebook is the latest of many businesses that have pushed back in-person return to the office, joining Amazon and Lyft with the target date of at least January of next year before they start bringing people back. LinkedIn is turning on a new feature that's going to let companies and individuals signal how they're looking to work, remote, hybrid, all in, in person or on promise. Uh, there's a piece in the Times as we're recording this about how Wall Streeters are rebelling um, from the pressure being placed on them to be back in the office. And overall, there's this sort of view that to be competitive, um, a company needs to offer a work from home package. So how much right does a company have to force people to come back to the office in a time like this? Luigi, what do you think? I think there is a, a, a big issue about uh, the cost uh, in terms of human lives, especially for the kids and, and all the stuff. But that is uh, a bit complicated to calculate, and I, I don't think I have any comparative advantage. I think the more economic issue is, is this a new, better way to organize production, or is uh, simply what we're trying to make a do at moment of extreme uh, problems, tensions, and, and so on and so forth? And, and I think it's more the former rather than the latter. And as every new form of production, uh, there are a lot of resistance. There are a lot of people that are not uh, used to. Clearly, there is a loss of control, or at least of psychological sense of control, of the boss vis-a-vis -vis the subordinates. Part of the resistance, as is often the case in life, is from people who are used to do things the old-fashioned way, and they find diminish if you don't continue that way. But I think that actually one of the great things about capitalism is the experimentation of different forms. And I think we are in an exciting new phase of experimentation. And I am not saying that every job should be done from home, but I think having that flexibility is great. And uh, pretty quickly, we're going to figure out what works and what doesn't. I think it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves. It's funny because when this topic comes up, I finally realize that I have a big bias that prevents me from seeing the intellectual arguments clearly. And my big bias is that I think human contact is good because it forces people to remember that other people are people too. And it makes it less likely that we're all going to kill each other in some giant conflagration because we're going to remember each other's shared humanity. So I have this weird bias about people going back to the office or at least going back to the office as a stand-in or as a, uh, as a as a microcosm of people having contact with other people. So take take what I say with this with, with, with a grain of salt, with that grain of salt offered up. But I'm I'm surprised by how quickly we've the old arguments about culture went away. I mean, up until the pandemic, companies were building increasingly elaborate headquarters with dry cleaning and pet care and child care because culture was so important. And it was so important for you to be around other people in your company. And all of a sudden, that, that narrative just flipped on a dime, particularly in Silicon Valley. And it became, oh, we don't need culture. We don't need offices. You don't have to be here. And I don't know. Is the truth 
is the truth somewhere in the middle? Um, I can't help but believe that the truth is somewhere in the middle. And then I am plagiarizing um, someone else's thought, but it's it's a banking executive who I was talking to the other day. And he said that what's going to, per your point about control and about bosses losing control of their subordinates, he said that what's coming that is going to be very hard for people to get used to is going to be white collar workers having to allow their bosses and their companies control over their lives when they're working from home, monitoring in a way that only used to be done if you were a blue collar worker where you could only take a 15 minute bathroom break here or there, but that it's coming to white collar workers who want to work from home because bosses aren't going to let themselves lose that kind of control. And so that if you are going to choose the work from home option, you're also going to have to submit to a kind of monitoring of what exactly you're doing during the day that um, that might make it not very fun to be working or to be working from home. And I don't know, maybe that's a little bit um, apocalyptic, but but I'm, I'm all in favor of any form of experimentation, really. That it is it is capitalism. So I can't I can't complain that it's a capital isn't. I just am not sure about how this evolves or how I I would like it to evolve if I if I rule the world. <laughs> I'm I am more optimistic. I think that uh, that level of surveillance will be so idiot that will not last very long because uh, I can be in front of a computer and do a lot of other things. So if I'm forced to be in front of the computer, my contrarian spirit will make sure that I don't work and uh, trying to, to play the game or just uh, uh, define the boss. So I don't think it's going to go very far. It is interesting, though, and what might not be the capital, what might be the capital isn't in all of this is the degree of hypocrisy right now. And I only have anecdotal evidence to support this. But a lot of Wall Street firms are not a lot, but some will say, sure, fine, work from home. And I have a friend who did that and took a job working from home in Chicago for a team that was based in Boston. And she ended up having to leave the job because she found that because she wasn't in the office, she got squeezed out of all the assignments, squeezed out of her team. And so even though the marketing was work from home, it actually wasn't true once she was there. And I think a bunch of people are discovering that in finance, that what your company says may actually not be the way your place or your group works. And that level of hypocrisy, I don't don't like. I wish companies would just tell it as it is. Your career is going to suffer if you choose to work from home. You can do it. We're not going to tell you to come back in the office, but you know what? Your career is going to suffer and you may find it difficult to survive here. Just be honest, right? Yeah, but remember the, the episode uh, with Claudia Golden? I think a lot of this uh, being there is not really productive. It's just showing your face and trying to steal the job and the client from somebody else who is not there. So it's completely rent-seeking. It's not really doing a better job. And is uh, favoring disproportionately men over women. I think having a, a better organization that allows people to work from home is also more gender neutral. I don't agree with that at all. There's a reason why during this work from home period, women have left the workforce at unprecedented levels. And that's it's not because working from home is gender neutral. It's because working from home means that you are in charge of your children 24 seven. And it means that you're never going to get anything done because the only way you as a woman, it could advance unless you were already pretty senior was by leaving your home to go to the office so that you had to be there. And I think this is going to create a terrible double standard for women where, well, if you're a good mother, wouldn't you choose the work from home option? Because then you can be with your kids. And what that means is that you can never function at the level of your male colleagues because you're with your kids. And there is absolutely no way until maybe your kids are in their mid-teenage years that you can function normally with children at home. You just cannot. And so I think it's actually going to be one more thing that, that possibly hold that having this option is going to be one more thing that possibly holds women back because it's going to be an option that if you were a good person, if you were a good mother, you would choose that. You would be with your kids as much as you possibly could. And now your company is making that possible. Bingo. But you'll never rise to the top. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.